I'm Dr. Steve Claypool and I'm reviewing the evidence base on carbohydrates. If you watched my first carbs video, you're probably thinking, okay, great Claypool, you blathered on and on about glycemic index and you never showed us any data. This is supposed to be evidence-based nutrition. Where's the evidence? Okay, let's dig in. So here we go. These two meta-analyses evaluated the relationship between glycemic index and cardiovascular diseases. In the first trial, 10 prospective cohort trials were pulled together and almost 250,000 people were followed. The second trial included 15 trials and almost 450,000 people. In both studies, there was a significant association between consumption of diets with a high glycemic index and stroke and coronary heart disease. Interestingly though, overall the association was only present in women and overweight people. For women, the relative risk of heart disease comparing high glycemic load to low glycemic load diets was about 1.5. In other words, these women were about 50% more likely to develop heart disease. 50% higher risk! Sorry ladies, carbs seem to hit women harder than men. Watch out if you're overweight too. The same association is present for overweight people, whether men or women. Fat people also had about a 50% increased risk of heart disease comparing the high versus low glycemic load groups. For skinny men though, glycemic index and glycemic load were not associated with cardiovascular disease. Skinny men that consumed a lot of high glycemic index carbs had the same amount of cardiovascular disease as those that didn't eat these carbs. For the population as a whole, there is a linear relationship between consumption of high glycemic index foods and heart disease. The more high glycemic index carbs you eat, the greater your risk. But eating any amount increases the risk. Both glycemic index and glycemic load measurements were relevant, so it doesn't matter which measurement you use. As with other trials I've reviewed, these trials controlled for cardiovascular risk factors, which means they attempted to compare people that they have the same lifestyle and risk factor profiles, except for their diet of carbohydrates. Why not skinny men? More research is necessary to answer that definitively, but remember when I said that glycemic index varied based on how foods are cooked? Well, it varies based on person, too. Some studies indicate that men, especially thin men, and especially aerobically fit thin men, can eat foods that have a normally high glycemic index, yet they don't spike their blood sugar as high and they don't stress their insulin system. Higher blood sugar levels after eating likely contributes to other chronic diseases in addition to cardiovascular disease. This meta-analysis of 37 different studies associated the risk of multiple diseases with high glycemic index diets. The group eating the highest quintile of glycemic index was 40% more likely to develop diabetes, 25% more likely to develop heart disease, and 8% more likely to develop breast cancer. The group was also about 14% more likely to develop any chronic disease. Another comprehensive meta-analysis of 39 trials associated high glycemic index foods with colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer. Crap! Cancer too? Possibly. As expected, glycemic index also correlates with the risk of developing diabetes. In this meta-analysis of 24 cohort studies, every 100 gram increment was associated with an increased risk of 45%. The evidence is fairly strong that consumption of a lot of high glycemic index carbs increases the risk of diabetes, and it's especially true in women. This forest plot shows that the effect is statistically significant in women, and more prominent in women than men. In order to avoid boring most of you, I won't explain these stats, but I've presented them so the geeks among you can examine them more closely. Let's look further at randomized trials. All told, 15 randomized control trials have pitted good carbs versus bad carbs. In these trials, participants were assigned to eat one of the diets and the groups were compared. These trials were short term, so more study is needed, but they strongly suggest good carbs reduce the risk of diabetes compared to bad carbs. Let's look more closely at one of these trials. This study randomly assigned overweight participants to one of four different diets. Some were assigned bad carbs, that is, high glycemic index carbs. Others were assigned low glycemic index carbs, or good carbs. Others were assigned diets low in all carbs. The food was given to them and they were carefully monitored for compliance. They stayed on the diets for four weeks, then rotated to a different diet. Blood samples were drawn during the study. 
When comparing the diets high in carbs, the group that ate good carbs had lower insulin sensitivity compared to the group that ate bad carbs. The body had to secrete more insulin to achieve normal blood sugar levels with the bad carb diet versus the good carb diet for the same amount of carbohydrate. Again, they ate the same amount of carbs, just different types of carbs, but the bad carb diet stressed the insulin system more. This is a short-term trial showing that the body is impacted by even short amounts of bad Note that when the bad carb diet was compared to the diet that was completely low in carbs, there was no difference in insulin sensitivity. In other words, avoiding carbs completely wasn't better than eating lots of bad carbs. Only the diet that still had a lot of carbs but had good carbs was noted to have improved insulin sensitivity. This is important, so remember it when we come to an analysis of avoiding carbs completely with low carb diets versus eating healthy carbs with a low glycemic index. Eating healthy carbs appears to be a better choice than avoiding carbs completely. In another randomized trial, overweight adults were assigned to eat one of three diets for six months. The group assigned to eat a diet with good carbs had lower resting insulin levels and other blood tests suggesting a lower risk of diabetes. Oh, and the good carb diet lost more weight than the low fat diet. What if you already have diabetes? Do carbs matter for you? For patients that already have diabetes, this meta-analysis of studies showed that consumption of carbs with a lower glycemic index results in better control of blood sugars. Yes, diabetics in particular should consume carbohydrates with a low glycemic index over high glycemic index carbs. Next up, obesity. Obesity is frequently associated with carbs, but rather than blame all carbs, it's more important to look at good versus bad carbs. This is a review of six different randomized weight loss trials in overweight people, all short term, up to six months. In each of these trials, half the participants were assigned a low glycemic index diet, that is, they ate good carbs, and the other half a variety of other diets depending upon the study. In the sum of the studies, the good carb groups lost more weight and had more improvement in lipid profiles than those receiving control diets. Body mass, total fat mass, body mass index, total cholesterol, and LDL cholesterol all decreased significantly more in the good carb groups. In some of the studies, the good carb groups were assigned ad libitum diet, meaning they just ate until they felt full, and yet they still lost more weight than groups that had dietitian guidance to restrict calories. I'm not going to spend more time reviewing studies on obesity and weight loss during this talk because I'm going to devote an entire talk to this topic in the future, but note that bad carbs are associated with weight gain and obesity, whereas good carbs are not. Carbs with a high glycemic index, that is, bad carbs, also raise blood pressure. The DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, lowers blood pressure, and carbs with a low glycemic index are key components in this diet. I'll review the DASH diet in more detail in future talks, but a key message is that healthy carbs lower blood pressure, whereas unhealthy carbs raise blood pressure. This is an important factor to remember. Blood pressure is very modifiable and an important risk factor. And bad carbs also seem to cause chronic inflammation. This paper reviewed 22 studies. High glycemic index diets had higher blood levels of chronic inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. And low glycemic index carbs had anti-inflammatory properties. Quick review. High glycemic index foods like potatoes, corn, rice, and white bread cause rapid increases in blood sugar and stress the insulin system, which increases the risk of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, multiple chronic diseases, especially heart disease and early death, and possibly also some cancers. These foods may affect women and obese people more. Bad carbs! This is not true with foods with a low glycemic index, that is, good carbs. There are a lot of studies on fiber too. The amount of dietary fiber correlates fairly well with the same outcomes I just reviewed with glycemic index. High fiber diets are inversely associated with heart disease and other diseases. I'm not going to review this data though because I believe it is a surrogate marker of glycemic index. In other words, carbs with high fiber slow down the digestion of carbs into glucose and tend to have a lower glycemic index, but it is the glycemic index that is a more direct and important measure. But if you're unsure of a food's glycemic index, the fiber quantity probably gives you a good estimate of the glycemic index. More fiber is better. 
In my next video, I'll dig into specific foods like sugar and whole grains, as well as low-carb diets.